Welcome back to another one of your flip lectures. Today we're going to talk about Cold War foreign policy outside and after the Vietnam War. And so to begin this, we're going to talk about America's good neighbor policy and its strategy in Latin America. So the United States had been involved in Latin American politics and economics for a very long time. For back, back in the day of the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary, the United States viewed Latin America as kind of its protectorate. The United States also had a lot of heavy investments, and so they had an economic interest in the future of the area. And also after the Cuban Revolution, there was a fear that communism could spread further south of America's borders. And so because of this, in 1961, the Alliance for Progress is created by President John Fitzgerald Kennedy along with friendly Latin American governments. The idea of this was to bring um, American countries together in order to resist the influence of communism. And a part of this is going to be the creation of the School of the Americas, a U.S. training facility for counterinsurgency uh, for anti-communist fighters to fight in Latin America's civil wars. Unfortunately, several high-profile atrocities have been linked to School of the America graduates, and so this is one of the more controversial policies that the United States is going to take in the Cold War. Today, the School of the Americas is still around in a different form, and it's called the Western Hemisphere Institution for Sec Security Cooperation. But when we talk about uh, the School of the Americas, the reason that a lot of people protest it is because its graduates go on to work for some of the most oppressive regimes in the history of the Americas. And so every year, people still protest in the streets uh, to try to close down the modern version of it. And so if we talk about the U.S. intervening in Latin America, uh, there are 56 separate U.S. military interventions uh, during the Cold War. Uh, in Mexico, during the Mexican Dirty War, the United States backed the Mexican government. They supported the dictatorships in Haiti, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, Ecuador, Bolivia, El Salvador, Chile, Argentina, and Colombia. And so essentially the United States has a hand in almost all of these countries. And so our relations today are definitely characterized by these interventions that have happened all these years ago. And so in Mexico, as the government cracked down on uh, student protesters, the United States government assisted. In Haiti, the strong-armed dictator Papa Doc uh, Francois Duvalier is backed by the United States, as is the military dictatorship in Guatemala, which works with United Fruit and other U.S. business. Um, same thing with Honduras, where the United States economic interests is going to also bleed into political interests. In Panama, the United States even put in its own soldiers in order to ensure uh, the outcome of a potential civil war. They supported a coup in Bolivia, and they supported the government in El Salvador during the Salvadorian Civil War. This one especially is going to be big in America because several nuns and Jesuit priests are going to be killed inside the country by government forces, believing that they were working too closely with the rebels. And their bodies were buried in shallow graves and found, and this shined light on the El Salvadorian situation. Also, too, the assassination of Archbishop Romero is going to show just how far these governments are willing to go in order to stop revolutions or even reforms, and as well as the amount the United States is willing to put up with in order to keep these allies. Uh, the El Mazote Massacre in 1981, well known by American government, but ignored because of the fear of communist spreading in El Salvador. In Chile, the United States assisted in the coup of Augusto Pinochet against the democratically elected Salvador Allende because Allende was elected as a socialist and he was a communist sympathizer. And so in 1973, with the approval of the CIA, Augusto Pinochet took over the government and then created internment camps, the kinds of which that Americans tend to say we are very much against. And so in Chile, they even turned the National Soccer Stadium into a detention camp as they tried to crack down on the communist elements inside of the country. Eventually, in 1989, Pinochet is going to be ousted by a popular vote, but that is after a lot of years of oppression of the people of Chile. In Argentina, the Dirty War, which is going to disappear um, a lot of people and hold them and torture them in uh, government facilities, is also going to be supported and backed by the United States. And so ultimately, when we talk about this time, the United States is heavily involved. They help fund the Colombian Civil War, and ultimately, the United States 
in view of Latin America is that it is a Cold War battlefield. And so though U.S. foreign policy has always been one of hegemony, that's dominance of a powerful country over weaker ones, this threat to U.S. The, this threat to the U.S. dominance of, of the region is going to change from European colonial power to the threat of international communism. And so in order to continue economic exploitation of nations, as well as to prevent the spread of communism, the United States is going to choose its allies in Latin America, but that history is still going to color our relationship with those countries today. And so moving away from Latin America, the United States also has to deal with its major competitors, which are the Soviet Union and China. And so Richard Nixon is elected in 1968 on the promise that he was going to bring the Cold War to a different place. And so when Richard Nixon is elected, he runs as an anti-communist, and he was made famous, remember, during the anti-communist days of McCarthyism. But for his money, he was a foreign policy realist. And so he believed in a future in which a lot of different countries would have a seat at the table. And so he fundamentally believed that the, in order to lessen the dangers of the Cold War, they needed to build up better relationships with their rivals. And so the strategy of trying to lessen tensions and relieve tensions with the Soviet Union is going to be known as detente. And so detente is going to begin in April of 1971 with ping pong diplomacy. Um, the U.S. ping pong team was playing a game in Japan, was playing a match in Japan when the communist government invited the U.S. ping pong team to come play an exhibition and visit their country. These were the first Americans to be invited since the revolution in 1949. But Nixon read this right as a signal that China wanted to have friendly relations with the United States. And so Nixon visits China becomes the first American president to visit communist China. And this is a huge, huge moment because the U.S. had been trying to isolate China. Now they would try to befriend them. But the reason that Nixon is able to go to China and negotiate is really because he is the most anti-communist American politician. No one can accuse him or Chairman Mao of being weak in compromising because both men have kind of the ideological purity. But Nixon also wanted to open up China to the West, open up China's trade to the United States, open up Chinese diplomacy to the United States. And he saw this as the opportunity to actually split the Soviets away from the communist Chinese. And so the United States changes a few things. They allow more trade. And they also stop recognizing Taiwan as the government. And they create the one China policy in which communist China, from this moment until today, is recognized by the U.S. government as the legitimate rulers of China. And so as a part of this visit, there was cultural exchanges, there was diplomatic meetings, um, there were dinners to be had, and ultimately, the world looked at this as a very positive thing, that the two leaders got together over ping pong diplomacy and managed to pull the world a little bit back from war. And so not to be outdone, the Soviets then did not want to risk being split off the Americans and Chinese versus the Soviets. And so May of 72, the Moscow summit is called where Richard Nixon is able to go to the Soviet Union and meet with the new Soviet leader, uh, Leonid Brezhnev. And at this meeting, they signed the first strategic arms limitation or SALT treaty, which is going to limit the amount of nuclear weapons that both sides are going to have. They also agreed to increase trade, as well as exchange of basic scientific information. And it's in these kind of early 70s that tensions become the lowest of the entire Cold War. We are negotiating both with the Soviet Union and the Chinese, and it looks like the world is stepping back from conflict. And so ultimately, though Nixon's domestic policy is going to be marred by Watergate, as well as um, kind of, you know, use of force, his foreign policy is incredibly successful. And so at the Moscow summit, the world takes a few steps back from nuclear war, and the SALT-1 treaty is going to open up the world to this idea of limiting arms rather than getting more. But by 1974, Richard Nixon's star had fallen at home. And so GP Vice President Gerald Ford is sworn in as president when Nixon resigns. Unfortunately for Gerald Ford, he would pick up a new series of po policy problems in the 1970s. But unfortunately for President Ford, new foreign policy problems outside of the Soviet Union are going to crop up in the 1970s. 
And so it's in the 1970s that the Middle East starts becoming a major concern for the United States. Um, the new state of Israel, having several major conflicts uh, with the Arab nations around it, are going to put America in the position of being seen as supporting Israel over the Arab nations. The 1967 Six-Day War and the 1973 Yom Kippur War are going to sour relations between the United States and Arab states. However, in Iran, there is a pro-U.S. leader called the Shah who is the cornerstone of America's strength in the Middle East. But by far in this time, the most influential of all these Arab states is going to be that of Egypt. So if we take a look at the map, we can understand a little bit better about kind of why this area is going to be so important. The state of Israel right here is going to be bordered by all Arab nations around it. But if you look at where Iran is, as well as the Middle East, it's very close to Russia, as well as to other countries that are a part of the Soviet Union. And so for the United States to lose, support in the Middle East could potentially be disastrous. And so in the grand scheme of the Cold War, the Middle East becomes a battleground similar to that of Southeast Asia, as both countries are going to scramble for influence. But the United States' first kind of major setback in the Middle East is going to be the 1973 OPEC embargo. And the OPEC states refused to ship petroleum to the U.S. because of support for Israel in the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War. And so the result of this is fuel shortages and high gas prices around the country, leading to restrictions that hadn't been seen in the United States since the Second World War. And so the President of the United States fails to really end this oil embargo, and the United States economy is going to suffer because of it. So Gerald Ford fails to deal with the OPEC embargo, but he does continue to negotiate with the Soviet Union. However, many of Nixon's um, agreements were not lived up to in the end. And what happens throughout the, 19, throughout the mid to late 1970s is the American public becomes less and less trusting of this idea of detente with the communist powers. And so in 1976, Jimmy Carter is elected president, and he comes in very hopeful that he'll be able to deal with some of the crises that Gerald Ford was unable to. Um, he sees himself as a man of the people. He sees himself as a peacemaker, so he immediately sets out to try to accomplish that. However, Carter's presidency is immediately going to be met with problems. Um, Carter is going to publicly criticize the Soviet Union in a way that Richard Nixon did not, which led to a breakdown in U.S.-Soviet relations. In 1973, the Soviets invade Afghanistan, and Jimmy Carter decided to boycott the Olympics as well as put a grain embargo on the USSR. And so essentially, under Jimmy Carter, detente will be over and tensions are going to rise again between the major powers. But in the Middle East, uh, Carter is actually going to have some incredible success. At Camp David, uh, he gets the leaders of Israel and Egypt to come together and sign the first major peace agreement between the state of Israel and an Arab nation. So he manages to bring them together. However, Carter's presidency will always be characterized by the Iran hostage crisis that broke out in 1979. What happened in 1979 was there was an Islamic revolution in Iran. Um, the United States then gave the overthrown leader, the Shah, refuge in the United States, which led to the Iranian revolutionaries taking the United States embassy and holding Americans hostage. All rescue attempts failed, and eight soldiers died in one of the attempts. And so the Iran hostage crisis um, is one of the biggest challenges to American power in the world and in the Middle East. And led by the Ayatollah Khomeini, Iran is going to change radically from its pro-U.S., pro-democracy views into um, a new government led by this Ayatollah. And so by holding on to these hostages, Iran was able to project its strength abroad, as well as kind of challenge the strength of the United States. And so this, in a lot of ways, still today, is one of the biggest um, kind of factors in the way that Americans think about the Iranians today. Eventually, the hostages are freed and sent back, and none of them are harmed. But ultimately, it's this idea that other spots in the world, outside of the United States and Soviet Union, are starting to change and assert themselves all over the world. Which brings us to our last presidents of the Cold War. And so in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded, invaded Afghanistan for the second time. And so the Soviet-Afghan War in 1979 is going to be a very, very fascinating one. 
Um, first off, the communist government in Afghanistan, which had been propped up by the Soviet Union, is going to come under attack by nationalists, Arab nationalists, who want to basically establish an Afghan state outside of Soviet control. And so the USSR, fearing that to lose Afghanistan would kick off its very its own dominoes falling against it, is going to get involved for the same reasons the US gets involved in the Vietnam War. And the United States, similar to the Soviet Union, finds guerrillas in order to arm and help fight. These people that they're going to arm are going to be called the Mujahideen. And they're going to see themselves as fighting a jihad, a holy war, against the Soviet Union. And one of the big leaders of this is going to be a familiar name, Osama bin Laden. And so Osama bin Laden is one of the early leaders of the Mujahideen, is funded and trained by the CIA. And at the end of the Afghan war, a lot of people were hopeful that, es that essentially that peace could come into the Middle East. But as we know, that would not be the case. And so in 1980, Ronald Reagan is elected president, and he is going to come in with a very different foreign policy idea. Reagan will be the first president in some time to reject containment. And in fact, he will want to defeat the Soviet Union, and he openly called it in speeches the evil empire. Reagan also was an advocate of peace through strength, and he spent $1.5 trillion on defense to have a massive military buildup, including programs like, like Star Wars, which was a missile defense system that fired lasers that never actually was completed. But the goal of Reagan's foreign policy was to force the Soviet Union into an arms race, that they could ill afford to keep up with the United States, and hopefully that would put pressure on their government to collapse. But Reagan is also going to um, up the U.S.'s commitment to anti-communist fighters in the world. They're going to supply the Mujahideen, the Contras in Nicaragua. They're going to overthrow the government of, of Grenada. And so the United States is kind of circling back in the 1980s into this early Cold War idea of arming these rebel groups to fight. And a lot of this kind of view of the United States kind of out and out trying to defeat communism shows up in a lot of movies of the era, if you look at 80s films. But Reagan's eagerness to end communism also is going to lead to kind of some interesting things. And so the Iran-Contra affair is going to be one of America's more controversial foreign policy events, where the Reagan administration secretly sold weapons to the Iranians in exchange for the release of hostages, and then sent the money from those illegal weapon sales to the Contras in Nicaragua. Because it was illegal to sell weapons to Iran, and it was illegal to continue to fund the Contras, and so the President of the United States, knowingly or not, um, his people thought that this illegal arrangement was the way to accomplish what they had wanted to do, even though it was against the law. And so even though this was never linked all the way to the president, it did hurt the president's standing among Americans. But by 1985, the Cold War was starting to come to an end. And a new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, became the leader of the Soviet Union. And he began meeting with Reagan. And in all of these meetings, Ronald Reagan kept pushing the Soviets and putting pressure on them to reform, to tear down the Berlin Wall, to open up the country to the West. And so the Soviet Union, because it was struggling with its economy, spending too much money on its military, began to collapse under its own weight. And so they tried a couple of reforms that ended up leading to the end of the Soviet Union. First was perestroika, restructuring, allowing for some private property and privately owned businesses to run. The other idea was glasnost, allowing more political and religious freedom, which ultimately is going to lead to, obviously, more political challenges to the communist system. And so in 1988, George H.W. Bush, who was probably our most accomplished foreign policy mind in 1988, is elected president. And he is then going to guide the Cold War into a nice, soft landing. The Cold War is not going to end with a war or with nuclear weapons flying, but is simply going to end peacefully. And in 1989, peaceful revolutions are going to replace a number of failed communist governments across, across Europe, in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and beyond. In 1989, the Berlin Wall is going to be torn down, uniting the two sides of um, Berlin and eventually reuniting Germany as one country. And though hardline communists do try to take over the government in, in Russia, it is going to fail. 
and Mikhail Gorbachev is going to hand over power to the first democratically elected leader of the Federation of Rus Russia, Boris Yeltsin. And so after the Berlin Wall comes down and new governments are created, the world which had been characterized by this threat of two superpowers is going to ultimately come to a peaceful end. So December of 1991, the Soviet Union was declared over and, and a new world was going to emerge. And so the Cold, while the Cold War was over, challenges would remain. How would the U.S. use its status as the lone superpower? What would the U.S.'s role in the world be without a Soviet Union or a communism to fight? What would all the fallout from the wars and interventions of the Cold War be? And what new ideas would guide U.S. foreign policy into the new millennium?